All right, so welcome everyone again to another episode of Notes from the A-Love, an A-Love's high point from which all things are visible, and from our vantage point, we'll be looking at tabletop role-playing games, their design, and the theory behind those designs. Around here, our motto is to be fair, build up, and have fun. I'm your host, Griffin Rowe, joined by our editor, Theta, our local designer, Norman Rafferty, and our good friend and GM, Red Rabbit. When it comes to tabletop games, I have 15 years of experience running, playing, and frequently fixing problematic rule sets at the table. Pronouns are he, him, they, them. Red, why don't you go next? And you can call me Red Rabbit. I do professional game mastery, mastering, and I'm currently running games of Iron Claw, Second Edition, um, Vampire, The Masquerade, Fifth Edition, and Dungeons and Dragons, Fifth Edition. And I like to consider myself a student of narrative and of game design. And Rafferty. Hello, world. Uh, I'm Norman Rafferty. He, him, Sanguine Games. Uh, I work as an art director and writer and editor and conventioneer and I'm so so tired um hmm. so uh yeah and uh when the, if there's time left over uh, i work on role playing game. all right so for today guys i have an idea let me throw you this pitch let's play a game where we each start a business while we'll manage employees acquire contracts resources and fight it out over who gets to buy the corner lot and we'll play it all in dungeons and dragons hmm. oh wait I got another one. I want to do a hyper-realistic sci-fi game about piloting a rocket to a new world to settle it, and we'll do it in World of Darkness, and we'll have the drive skill apply to every vehicle and robot you have to manage to make it work. You uh, have to be clear, these are bad ideas, and neither system really handles these scenarios. I think we can agree on that, right? Well, well now, hold on. You forgot <laughs> riding. I think if oh, we're gonna, riding. you could ride your drone. That's right. I oh. make this. I make this <laughs> statement now that Cyberpunk 2020 could handle any game setting <laughs> with its 38 different skills. Yeah, That's... you, you laugh. Oh, but... There's 38. How can I keep up? <laughs> but but Vampire First and Second Edition talked about going into space, and um, mm. and also there are many many stronghold books out there for. Dungeons and Dragons, even fifth edition. Right. Um, but to go right, ahead and I continue. Think I think your point being that um you can force any game to do any scenario you want. Uh it's not necessarily going to be ideal at. Mm. Right. It, it's very clear that these systems are set up for certain things. Vampire is about brooding and being creatively sneaky in a world looking to expose you. And Dungeons and Dragons is about being heroic and going on adventure to beat up some monsters. So you want to play to those systems' strengths. You don't want to do something entirely outside of even their scope of rules. So if sunlight kills vampires, is it just this sun? And what is it about the sunlight? Is it the UV radiation, the wavelength? Is it a mystical <laughs> curse placed upon the entire universe? If so, what's the source of that? And does that prove God? I mean, yeah, can vampires not... exist in vacuum? That's the... yeah, because there's some like I don't think it's true in vampire, but there are some vampire movies and stories I've seen where they walk around with sun lamps because sun lamps kill vampires. That's pretty uh, funny. I need someone to so, draw a vampire in an astronaut suit now. I mean, it depends on who you ask. Mm. It's, but if, I don't think I don't think sun lamps actually work in Vampire the Masquerade, or they use them. Uh, they don't. And I at least remember the Bloodlines video game like makes a funny point of it. It's like, oh yeah, I'm going to test this on you. Ah, no effect. Well, we'll move on. We'll try fire now. Yeah, for some reason, it's only that sun. Uh, we, by the way, we're not inspired by Anne Rice. Shut up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think when, when I brought this up of a nothing is universal, it's kind of like you can hammer. Uh, it's more like you'll run into a problem where games contradict this. Like, like I have a bug up my butt about Dungeons and Dragons because there's a whole bunch of spells in Dungeons and Dragons that can short circuit or solve almost you know a lot of the adventures they present to you. And this gets into what we were talking about, like game mastering and that kind of thing, playing to lose and that kind of stuff. It's like. Like it used to drive me nuts, especially in Eberron, where I was constantly playing in Eberron, where we would be presented some scenario of someone got away or something happened here. And I would say, well, we're going to cast a first level spell or use one of our first level abilities to completely solve this problem. <laughs> and, and, and they would say, well, that doesn't work. 
because the adventure requires it. And that's what I usually mean by saying no system is universal because Dungeons and Dragons makes certain assumptions about the way mm-hmm. their world works that will not work if you try to do other stories with it. You can't do uh, Lord of the Rings with D&D because D- D- elves in D&D are not the same as elves in Lord of the Rings. Now, people could say, well, what if we just change that? Okay, now we, where Vanyar fit into this? You have to make a Vanyar race. And then we get into the Ship of Theseus problem. After we change all of your you know, ancestries, all of your classes, and your spell system, and your uh, combat resolution, are we still playing D&D? Right. I would think I would definitely say at that point, you've created a completely unique thing just with a D20 moniker on it now, which is half the point of like the whole open game license thing, by the way, but well, sort of, but I mean, but, but but, I mean, that gets into the idea of you could bang on it, but eventually, you know, uh, uh, I mean, that gets to a better question of like, is the OG, is, is there a system that's generic enough that you can apply it to any universal thing? Like, is there a like fundamental, but now you run into the problem of, well, the simpler you make the game, you know, of course it applies to more things, but then, you know, is it really a game? That's kind of like saying, like, you have a PC. You can now play any game you want because they shipped it with the Visual C redistributable. You can if just write the game you want to play right now. Oh, if I mean, only it were so yeah. easy. Do I have <laughs> tales to tell you? Yeah, right. Yeah. But the other issue is that there's the implication that, like, these games were designed to tell specific types of stories. The reason that the mechanics, that the rules are the way they are as written is that presumably somewhere along the line, a game designer wanted to create rules that would elicit a specific experience, one that felt true to the source material they were trying to recreate. So I'm going to be cynical and say no. Uh, these games I mean, are, maybe not. Uh, yeah, I mean, in theory, that's in what theory. It is. Ideally, yeah, that's yes, that's what people should like be trying to do. The, all the games you love, like Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and Vampire, were written by many people. Some of whom Whoa. had specific agendas when they came to the table, because Jim Ward's agenda was different than Gary Gygax's, was different from Monty Cook's, was different from Ed Greenwood's. They all had different things when they came to the table of what they wanted to do with it. And they wrote their own sections, and they may actively contradict each other. If you're a Pathfinder player, you know what I'm talking about. Um, And then, not to mention that, sadly, some of the people who showed up were also just jobbers who were trying to fill words. I know, I hate to break the veil that way. So, (laughs) um, and and, like, if you've ever had arguments... Yeah, if you, and if you've ever had arguments with other people about what the game should be about, remember, the game designers had the same arguments, too. I mean, I'm yeah. sure there were editors who were arguing about that, uh, you know, and, and certain things that showed up and didn't. And even after they came out, there are people arguing about what they mean and what they don't. The mm-hmm. game itself, the, when you sit down and pick out your very rules for the game, you are making fundamental assumptions about the play that would be different from a from another game that might have other different fun- assumptions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that there's also crossover a lot of the times, too. I mean, I, I mentioned this before. I think that a lot of when you tell me uh, Vampire the Masquerade horror stories, it's not that I don't believe that they are real. I can totally believe people play the game that way. To me, it feels like people would approach the game as they would approach Dungeons and Dragons, which I think is a lot, I think is is predicated on a lot of assumption. Yeah, that, that's a huge assumption. Over. Vampire is hugely popular with people. It was very much many people's first game. So mm-hmm. I can understand why you might approach it that way, but there were a lot, you know, Vampire was very written and very much many people's first game. They weren't playing it like D&D. If they were, then I could see how you'd have different things going on. Mm-hmm, oh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, Griff, I cut you off. I don't know what oh, you were no. going to say. But that okay, was my so I'll point. go ahead and hit someone. Uh, so there's there's one bugbear that like you hit on a lot, Rafferty, which is a lot of people will say, like, D&D isn't a combat game. And I think probably in this conversation, it'd be good for us to explain it and the, the point behind saying that, which is hmm. uh, you could probably do a lot of things in a lot of systems, but those aren't the things they're good at. And there's definitely a difference between purpose and then 
doing the things that any RPG kind of does. Like, of course you can talk to the kobolds. You still have a mouth and you're still at the table playing a game. Well, so something that occurred to me was the mixed message that they're sending. Like, for example, people might say D&D is not a combat game, but I'm fixated on, then why are there fighters? And Why is every class about increasing your combat ability? Yeah, that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't bother me that all the classes have combat ability. No, the more I think about it, the fighter disgusts me. Because the fighter doesn't just fight. I'm oh, sorry. The fighter just fights. That's what I mean to say. That's mm. all the fighter gets to do. They didn't give the fighter persuasion, diplomacy, stealth, thievery. They didn't give them the option of those. They give them athletics and a bunch of other stupid skills. Um, if you want to do anything else with a fighter, maybe you pick a background like nobility or, but that's it. They they, they literally say that if you picked fighter, that's all you will be doing today. They give the cleric freaking, well, actually I don't know the cleric, but in other words, if you picked that, they, the rules like automatically pigeonhole you into fighting. And so people could argue, well, you could just not play a fighter, but you know, this brings in the question of the whole game is written around the idea that you'll have monsters that come at you and you need tanks to tank the damage and the fighters to tank in class. But what was the decision in the designers' heads that fighters, if anything is going on that isn't fighting, fuck your fighters, they don't get to do anything. They don't get to go to the library, they don't get to diplomacy, they don't get to hang around with thieves, they don't get to do any of that stuff. We're not going to give them any of those abilities. We give those all to other classes, like the rogue class gets those and fighting or whatever. It's like, what was the decision behind that? And the answer is that's not a problem if you didn't care. I, I mean, I, I would go one step further, like with Dungeon World is the one game that I like to point out. Uh, it's, a, it's a game I recommend to people that they play, but Dungeon World has such, it, like has no provisions for anything other than the dungeon. Like the, right. that system at least very much knows what it wants to do, right? It's it's about going to the dungeon. Go to the dungeon, please. Just going to the dungeon. Do the dungeon. It's not that you can't do other things with it. It's not that you couldn't improvise things that you do with it, but the game doesn't like you don't rent inns or build strongholds or um persuade people. I can't do uh, my taxes. Uh well, but I, like they don't have that's a, just a separate statement altogether. I cannot do my taxes. Please continue. <laughs> I mean, oh, that's a question. Go ahead. Well, it's a question of, of proscriptive too. Like nothing mm-hmm. in Dungeon World says you can't do those things, but they don't discuss them or provisions. Yeah, that gets into a big old school debate. Like people who love old school games will point out that like you can do anything in an old school game. Well, some people will say, well, no, you can't. You know, it, it says here that you know these things just happen to me and I react to them. Well, yes, but we didn't have a rule that said you can't do it. Or made a yeah. rule that made it difficult for you. We had no rule at all, and that gets freedom through a mission, yeah, right. right. And then that gets into the question of if there's no rule, you know, if there's no rule for it, am I allowed to do it? That's a good yeah. question. Well, so what you and what Griffin have been hitting on is this interesting thing where, for as much as you know, role playing games. We consider them. We consider the role playing to be separate, right? Like you don't. Yeah. I mean, more and more we're seeing interesting things in this space, but mostly like D&D doesn't give you rules for role playing. Role playing is just something you do. Like Griff said, you have a mouth, there's kobolds, use your mouth on the kobolds or talk to them, I guess. But like, that's something that it is implied is like, hey, if there's not a rule that covers this, it means you guys just get to play make believe. And that goes to Rafferty's point about old school gamers saying like, well, the game was much more free back then. Because there is this implication now that anything that isn't adjudicated by a mechanic is in the realm of this role play thing that we all know kind of how to do, but it doesn't, it's not codified. Um, that is very interesting to me. Yeah, I got to trip some things there because when you say role playing is something we all know how to do, we're talking about nothing is universal. What does mm-hmm. role playing mean? Like, I, I, right? I'm always fond of, of pointing out like people love anime, they love Mob Psycho and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Um, but you know, if you document those stories, most of the role playing is people showing up and trying to kill each other in an incredibly convoluted way. Mm. It's not a lot mm. of, you know, Hey, we got in a bus and went to this place in the desert and then encountered someone who tried to kill us and got in a big fight. Uh, probably you know, abstract now to like, that's an entire segment of all culture problems. Like, Oh, a lot of these stories about conflicts are literally about murdering each other. Like, oh, 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 a little sketchy. 
what I mean by that is like you know, people like some of this stuff like One Punch Man and Mob Psycho and freaking Yu-Gi-Oh are like there are little interludes and then there are big fights that are involved mm-hmm. with lots of stuff. So it's still a story. People love watching it. Watching your big tournament arcs in Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that is still exciting. A lot of people go watch it. They like it. They think it's cool, but it's fighting. So mm-hmm. you can have storytelling that is fighting, but there's this like prejudice when you get to the gaming table that, oh mm-hmm. no, fighting is not role-playing. We don't posture in it. We don't make threats to each other. We don't make sacrifices. We don't have people yelling at us, don't die. We don't have the power of friendship overcoming anything. No, 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 no. This is a war game now, and we're not gonna we're not gonna have any of that affect our play. Well, we we got to see if you tied your shoes today, and you get a minus two penalty to shoot. You know, oh, did you get trench get, foot? Two gaming, penalty, and, and some gaming has simplified that. Like like Dungeon World is the one that like you know, makes my head hurt because it's literally oh, okay, when we sat there and we rolled dice at it until they died. Um, it's um, yeah, I know the comment section group that was like, well, what if you can do other things? But I'm talking about like like this is what's modeled in it. There are yeah. some people out there that might model like you know that kind of stuff, but but uh, to get to a better example, like Vampire is an example of a game that when you get started, it makes it very clear that we expect you to play a certain kind of character, namely a vampire, and mm-hmm. these are the behavior. By the way, Sun kills vampires in Vampire: The Masquerade. The Sun doesn't kill Dracula, and it doesn't kill Carmilla. It doesn't kill Varney, but it kills the vampires and Vampire of the Masquerade. So that's immediately a rule. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that, yeah. that's a rule. So, and then we say, okay, you got to belong to these clans. Here's how Mambakavians behave. Here's how Bruja behave. You know, um, here, here's, you know, a, here's how the Sabbat behaves. If you're going to be that. Like, they start getting into make these decisions with your character and all these kinds of abilities. And that helps mold you. Here's a humanity stat. Here's how blood goes up and down. These are not universal aspects of vampires. These are the vampire specific, the vampire, the masquerade. Now, you could possibly modify the system and tweak it, but we would have to ask at what point, you know, if I ran a vampire game that didn't have Brujas, Malkavians, and all of that lore in it, am I still running vampire? If I told you, let's play vampire, and you showed up and none of those clans were there, could you go home and say, oh, I didn't play vampire? Well, I want to respond, and I'm going to be very careful not to respond in terms of vampire, because I feel like this is a pattern we fall into. <laughs> but in vampire, of, do it for us, Red. Do do vampire us. day. It's either our podcast is either hating on D&D or me trying to defend vampire or dungeon world. So <laughs> just predictable patterns. But no, that's not what I'm doing, though. That's not what yeah. I'm doing. What I'm saying is that what's interesting about what you just said is that... Um, a lot of these games are modeling fiction that does not operate on mechanical rules. And they're trying to apply a layer of mechanics to them that makes them feel consistent, that are playable, that work within their own fiction, but also evoke these other these other things. And we see that um, it's the reason why elves don't sleep in D&D. Um, it's the reason why why vampires burn in the sunlight. And while it might not adhere to all, or vampires do burn in the sunlight, but it might not adhere to all of the tropes of fiction, but in many cases, we're drawing from such a huge ocean of literary reference that, like, what could encapsulate all of that and be consistent? Um, But I think that's also goes back to an earlier point, which is that these systems mechanically differentiate themselves because of the kind of stories they try to evoke or the genres that they draw from. Right. right. I mean, and there, and some of them are better at it than others. Like the vampire, the masquerade game does not entertain twilight. It, it, uh, it does not say <laughs> there's no yeah. supplement. No, book that, you know, you know, sure. Twilight's the most popular vampire story of all time, but why would you want to do, in other words, they won't have sparkly vampires or that kind of like, you know, or discuss that stuff. They won't do that. Mm-hmm. Dungeons and Dragons is a little more flexible of saying, okay, when you start your game, you can go ahead and pick an ancestry that you want to belong to and pick a class that you want to belong to. Um, and here are the ones we've presented. By the way, you can tweak these, and here are rules for tweaking them. So it's a little more flexible. It's a little more universal than other ones. Because I, 
I could run a D&D game where I said, okay, guys, it's nothing but Tabaxi and Lizard Folk. And, mm-hmm. and people would still say that was a D&D game. Like I said, if I tried to run Vampire and I said, okay, we're not using any of the clans, people would say that wasn't really a Vampire the Masquerade game. Dungeons and Dragons being a little more generic would be more accessible. But as Griffin pointed out as the example, like the more we get the more we get away, a stranger who showed up and said, Hey, I heard you guys were playing D D today. I brought my half elf ranger and would like to play, and then sat down and discovered all we were doing was surveying so we could build our stronghold castles and then we um, math out how much we dirt we can dig out with our dig spells and Matic of the Titans that day, that mm-hmm. person might go home and say, well, that really wasn't a D&D experience. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I mean, like, like th- those are kind of absurdism. I'm talking about, like, if someone had seen Twilight, said, I mean, here I am ragging on Vampire. Though. If somebody had seen Twilight and said, I want to do vamp- kind of vampire stuff, you would have to disabuse them of those notions when they got to Vampire the Masquerade saying yeah. it works differently in this. And if they wanted to play Twilight as a role-playing, there isn't a really good off-the-shelf solution for that. They might you know, People say, why don't you just take Fate and make up a hundred special rules for it? And it's like, well, it, even like, uh, like I can even get the nitty-gritty. Even at their core, the mere dice that you roll in a game and those mere expectations of skills and attributes and stuff like that will change the fundamental way the game works and and the and change the way the experience works and not you know necessarily i mean in different ways not not necessarily to match yeah. I, I think like you said before like uh the reason the rules exist is to constrain what you can do and tell you what you can't do creativity is kind of infinite you need some sort of boundary on the experience to say this is wherein we are talking today and I think that's why I like mm. the idea that any, that something could be universal isn't all that great, well, specifically because it removes that boundary, and now you don't really know where to tell people this is where we are. Yeah, I, I mean, like to question a big fundamental thing that happened to us, we were writing Urban Jungle, and playtesters were complaining, why do bullets kill people? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, 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 you know, like, more specifically, they said... We're, you know, we're having trouble with the game because the game is so lethal that when people use bullets and shoot someone, they go down in a pile and possibly die. And this isn't what we want. See, so this is interesting because I feel like maybe this is a one perspective that I have that I assume everyone has. And it's obviously not the case. But with many of these things, I, I feel like maybe I'm very tuned into genre convention. But when I see a game, the first thing I'm thinking about is like, oh, genre, right? This vampire game is obviously it's Anne Rice vampires. I mean, it may have gotten away in some cases. Obvious, they're not drawing from Twilight. Right. Um, when I look at Urban Jungle, I say, oh, 20s gangster stuff, like noir films, probably. Like, just right. from the art itself, I think it becomes very, very apparent. And so I, I assume certain things. And in many cases, those assumptions are bore out by the mechanics i would assume that a single gunshot fired from the hip in kind of like a you know stodgy fashion would be a serious deal because it would be in a noir story so that's very interesting like right. but the problem is we can contradict this by saying yes but um technically things like pulp fiction and sin city are also filed under noir uh, or the mafia wow. computer game or filed under noir, and if you play the Mafia game, you can take several bullets to the face before going down. So oh. maybe this is the real issue, is that uh, <laughs> maybe it's people interpreting uh, properties that are derivatives of a genre or referential to a genre as the genre itself. <laughs> that sounds like a real shitty gatekeeper well, thing to well, say. Sidetracked here, what I'm saying is, like, you would play a game differently if a bullet kills you. Like, if you, yeah. could, like, if you get one-hit kill games. Like, Call of Cthulhu is still a very popular game. And Call of Cthulhu is one of the most lethal games you could ever play. Because in Call of Cthulhu, when your hit points reach zero, you die. I think maybe in 7th edition, they might have tweaked it a little bit, but when your hit points get to three or less, you fall down. And you start with, like, 11. Mm-hmm. And guns do 2d6 three times around. So, mm. uh, you know, 
it, it, it's it, it's uh, and this is just the guns. I have monsters haven't shown up yet. Um, yeah, right. So so it's that kind of game where you expect it to be highly. You would have to go into the game expecting it to be highly lethal. Uh, and you would have it if you were. Uh, and Call of Cthulhu comes out of Rune Quest, which is one of the early you know creditors to D and D. So and they still make Rune Quest, so you could play a fantasy game Rune Quest, but and it has dwarves and elves in it. But yeah. if you played a game of Rune Quest, you would have a very different experience than if you played it with Dungeons and Dragons. And if I tried to model Lord of the Rings in Rune Quest. And I tried to model it in D and D, and I tried to model it in Decipher's official Lord of the Rings role play. You would have a different experience, despite the fact that all of the—I mean, even like bigger blank example—is there's three different versions plus of the Star Wars role play, but you'll have a mm -hmm. different experience in West End's version than in the D and D version than in the Fantasy Flight version, despite the fact they're all labeled Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah, they are definitely very distinct experiences. Right. With their own right. little conventions and such to kind of keep track of. And, and then the thing, people are loyal to one over the other. Like, people will play older editions of many of these games in lieu of the newer editions because that was, you know, the experience that they, they wanted, they got from those older editions. Mm hmm. Uh, the next question, we, we started this in Nothing is Universal. The game that was written to play Star Wars, the Genesis game system, is marketed right. as a generic game. Here yeah. we go. Right. But and it's not the first people to do that either. I was going to mention the Roll20 system as well. Had a, like a. There's, there's right. got a list of them. We'll go through them all. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, I think the first official one would be Mars, which is uh, from like 1980, uh, published by FASA, the same guys who made Shadowrun. Uh, oh, hey, there you go. But, but you also have Lords of Creation, which was supposed to be able to model everything from punks to gods. Uh, um, so GURPS Gurps was one, right? Gurps, was GURPS a Gurps. thing? Through the fantasy trip, it's the great unnamed role playing system, later changed in generic universal role playing system. Mm -hmm. uh, Hero Games eventually published one. World of Darkness is technically a generic gaming system. Right. That Does Rifts count, or is it too much its own thing? It counts because Rifts is from the Palladium home system, and the Palladium home system is a generic game system. There we go. There we go. Uh, Savage Rift Worlds, I think, uh, bills itself as Savage that, too. Savage generic version of that. Um, uh, BRP, which is the basis of Call of Cthulhu and RuneQuest, basic role-playing. Uh, mm -hmm. Fate mm -hmm. is very popular, and now they have Fate Accelerated, uh, which is based off of Fudge. Uh, there are numerous uh, um, pretenders out there to the generic throne. And, of course, I have to mention Trice, because uh, someone had. Sorry, um, what was it? You cut out for a second. That. Uh, Tri is the foundation of Big Eye Small Mouth. Uh, hey. and a bunch you of know, did I? No, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, please continue. Oh, I've heard of that system before. I don't think and I've ever then played there, it. And then there's the weird mutants where Hero Games teamed up with uh, the company that was making with Art Halsorian and they made Fusion, mm -hmm. which was the engine powering cyberpunk role playing game and uh, the first Usagi role playing. Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, I did not know that. And uh, yeah, that's Fusion. Fusion is the world's goofiest generic system because it's generic and then each version of it's completely different. Like some mm -hmm. versions tell you to roll a D10 and add stuff. Some versions tell you to roll 2D6 and add stuff. Some say roll 3D6 and add stuff. Some say choose when you roll if you want to add 1D10 or 3D6. Completely oblivious that the random curve on 3D6 is different from the random curve on 1D10. Whoa. I mean, yeah. if you don't know what's happening, then I guess it may as well be universal, <laughs> right? There you go. Yeah. Um, uh, How like life? Yeah. So your so your Project Red talking about great cyberpunk is they're mm -hmm. actually a bizarre hero system derivative. So the mm -hmm. champion MMO too. But um, but anyway, uh, yeah. The problem that that I think we, we I think one thing we would all agree on is that every universal system has to make some core assumption that might not apply in another game. Like mm. Genesis or D&D &D will give you like a lot of outs and luck and a lot of hit points so you can bounce bullets off of your face. This is different from basic role playing, like you know the one that powers Call of Cthulhu, that generic system, which will not. In fact, in that game system unless you jump through some serious hoops, 
you could always be killed in one hit. And you would play a game where you can bounce bullets off your face versus killed in one hit. You would play those two games differently. So the mere yeah. act of choosing which system we're going to use today dictates the style of the game. And that way, BRP mm -hmm. is not universal because it, you know, it was designed with something different than D20 or Genesis. Right, and even these universal systems will have like their own biases taken from other games where they might have a chart full of guns. And it's like, that kind of starts to define what this is going to look like no matter how you play. Hero System has like two pages of a chart of different random unarmed maneuvers you can do against people. It highly is trying to simulate a fist fight. Yeah. And that will define how your game runs. And yeah. there's some argument to be made that, oh, yeah, you know, sure, you don't inherently have powers to bounce bullets off yourself, but that's why you have points and you build the rule yourself. It's like, that's uh, no one's going to do that. They don't. They don't ever well, do that. It, it also matters about your sculpted experience because it's funny that you brought up, um, like, Vampire. Okay, so let's say you wanted to do a spacefaring adventure, and there's horrors in space, there's Event Horizon and Alien. What if we settled on World of Darkness? It's a generic game system. You could, in theory, build normal people with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we've got the Chronicles of Darkness. <laughs> standalone. I did game. run a, a Ghostbusters game using the old World of Darkness rules. Heck yeah. yeah. Right, okay, well then, here, like, here's the immediate thing you run into. So there's only one skill for science in mm. World of Darkness. Science. Mm -hmm. uh does that you know did you get any questions from your players or whether there should be more than one or were they more than happy to just uh, like accept there's just science and we all just do it it was many many years ago so i honestly do not remember i also don't think any of them were playing scientists <laughs> which is pretty funny given the oh, context but yeah. we're doing ghostbusters but none of us are scientists but none of them are scientists as yeah. opposed to ghostbusters yeah. where at least 60 percent of the cast are fine yeah. right. they're all Either comedians depends they on your hot expression yeah exactly <laughs> depends on your definition of what constitutes scientists yes i get your point mm -hmm. i mean they were all college professors <laughs> the exception of the one guy oh, yeah uh, like, the guy they just hired up yeah <laughs> they were teaching something um, Buster game filled right. with EPA inspectors. Oh, that had to be a sight. Or is a joke mm. that came up because it's in Iron Claw now, and it's definitely in um in World of Darkness. Where there's only one craft skill. It covers building everything mm -hmm. from fixing your PC to fixing your car to building a rocket ship into space. Um, you know, and like mm -hmm. there's one skill for it. Uh, or like some people like might complain that your game is like like in BRP, the Call of Cthulhu game. There's separate skills for every type of gun. There's pistol, there's shotgun, there's submachine gun, there's rifle. You have to buy a separate skill for each one. Uh, same thing in Palladium. But in World of Darkness, there's just firearms. Yeah. And then there's the hilarious move where they have guns in D&D &D 5 and you're not allowed to buy any proficiency in them at all. Uh, <laughs> um, don't get me started on so guns in D &D. I, I think in terms of uh, universalists and things, uh, we have talked about simulationism before and trying to get things, you know, working in certain ways and representing a world uh theta's asked like what's the most simulationist die rolling system that you've seen what you you mean like has a rule for everything uh that that just tries to simulate out things i think is kind of the key here maybe that's I mean, the question we're looking for raf is going to have a much better answer but i'll say oh, that sure. with my recent brush with the latest cyberpunk game i can say that it is Ridiculous that a game that takes place in a corrupt city environment has an animal riding skill in it. They're pretty friggin' exhaustive in that uh, book. I'm, but yeah, I'm curious I, I what Raph says. Cyberpunk read, but I believe you, because as mm -hmm. Rafferty is very cynically, it's like, you know, the people who were paid to write the Cyberpunk Red book weren't paid to write an empty book. Yeah. And, and plus, <laughs> I've had experience with the second and third and first editions of the game, so I believe you. It's like, yeah, yeah. just... yeah. You're, you're asking about multiple, uh, you know, schools of science. I think that book has like accounting, criminology, which sort of makes sense, but also just like politicking. Right. Like it's, it's so know, politics is the most important effect, skill. But there's one game that beats that, and unfortunately, it's it's obviously because I'm I've played Rollmaster and I've played mm. Trust. One game I've seen that probably had the most ridiculous level of simulation is is Eclipse Phase. Oh, Ooh. really? There's a sample character, a sample character, Clips Phase, a character they, they would say you would play this character mm -hmm. who has bought the electronic skill 
four times. Once as a craft skill, once as an engineering skill, once as a hobby, and once as an interest, which is a separate category for hobby. Wow. That is very impressive. Um, I think Shadowrun does a little bit of that, but definitely not to the same extent. I have seen a cliff phase do that. <laughs> uh, that that beats one of my favorite jokes from Rollmaster, where in Rollmaster there was a skill called poison detection, which is yeah. a separate skill from poison lore. Which <laughs> had one of my pretty good. Has, yeah, has one of my favorite moments in gaming where I walked up to one of our wizard guy and said, "Hey, the plants in this room are they poisonous?" And the GM says, well, he says, I don't know. I only have poison lore, not poison to deck. So I, suppose I know what to do if they are poisonous, but... I don't know what to do if they're poisonous. Neither of those skills are poison fixing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yikes. But more to the point, what we're getting at here is um, your rule system dictates what you care about. If you have that level of granularity, okay, like, for example, you said about cyberpunk. It's like, evidently, the people who wrote the cyberpunk game expect that if an animal showed up for some reason and you had to ride it, yeah, then we could look at you and say, you can't because you don't have animal handling as a skill, exactly. which is an assumption of the game. Because, like, you know, when Indiana Jones needs to go ahead and catch a vehicle that's getting away from it, he hops on a horse and rides after it. So in whatever game system Indiana Jones is in Raider of the Lost Ark, obviously he could just ride a horse without any issues, or at least yeah. successfully enough to catch a speeding vehicle. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, if you were trying to model that story, you would have to have a game that models that. And some games like Cyberpunk would say, well, you're not trained in this skill, so you have huge penalties. And so unless you're the world's luckiest roller, you'll just fail. Or might even say it's impossible if you're playing old school D and D. It's like you can't do something. You can't like D and D first edition. You can't swing a sword. You're not allowed. Mm-hmm. So I mean, there's, um, there's something kind of attractive about that too. It's like these skills are not just ignorable bonuses to a role. It's actually defining what your character can and cannot do. But that's yeah. a tangent. I'm sorry. Continue. Well, no, it's it's one of my favorite tangents. Like in Shadowrun, none of us had the throwing skill, so it was actually safer for us to drop grenades at our feet because we would fall the roll. <laughs> scatter away from us whereas if we tried to throw them across the room we went oh, <laughs> they might come back that's really funny yay <laughs> um, scatter dice yeah oh, always dear. a good idea and, and that's when we get into one of my favorite phrases that was so important we put it in our role-playing games the rules endorse the behavior if mm-hmm. you know in grand theft auto if i know i can bounce bullets off of my face i will get into gunfights if this was a game where the where a shot would kill me like deus ex classic like everyone talks about great Deus Ex as a video game, don't get shot in that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you'll you'll you could get incapacitated by a single unlucky shot. That dictates a different experience than you would have in say Mankind Divided or Human Revolution, where I would happily yeah. tank bullets because my health regenerates. Yeah. So um, you know, or the you see the same problem in like um Elder Scrolls, where in uh Skyrim everyone's health regenerates. So no one runs away because if you wound them, they just come back. And, uh, and, and, and that's emergent behavior that showed up in the system. And that also gets to what we were talking about earlier, where we argue about is role-playing separate from the system. It's like you put a bunch of numbers in front of me to inform my decisions. And especially if you're playing a game like Vampire, I'm a supernatural creature in Vampire. What the fuck does that mean? Uh, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, they could kill Dracula with bullets. Can I be killed with bullets? Hmm. Uh, did I buy a special ability like potence? Well, uh, what's the shield thing? Fortitude. Fortitude. Yeah. Fortitude, Sorry. resilience for yeah. the new well, one, I think. I resilience or fortitude. Well, like, what does that mean? And now the game itself has put it rules in there that that's a storytelling issue. Like, you know, vampires can't be killed with bullets. See? Blam, blam. Right. Suddenly, mm-hmm. you know, you've put rules. The rules now dictate the behavior in the game. If the rules don't match your story, if the game said vampires can't be killed with bullets, but someone does 21 aggravated points of damage in a single hit, you would say, okay, vampires can be killed with bullets. Because you know, one shot and they went down, as opposed to what you usually see in the game, which is several shots won't take them down. 
your rules have dictated a certain experience. You would have to change those rules to get you'll vampires behave differently in a D20 setting, and you can get D20 vampire than they would behave in World of Darkness. You won't have that's why nothing is universal. As soon as you've dictated some rules, some behavior in the game will change. Yeah. So the moral of the story is don't pay for universal game systems. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. I would say that like if a game don't believe anyone they say a rule system can apply to anything. Because like for example, right. 20 first game <clears throat> Because this was a huge shakeup. D D was ridiculously proprietary until 2000. Then yeah. D twenty came out, and everyone said, "Okay, you can do anything you want with D twenty." You know, yeah. now you know, hooray, we've solved gaming," said Ryan Dancy. Now everyone <laughs> can play D and I mean, D twenty. All other games can go home and quit. It's all D twenty now. Yep. Ryan Dancy will tell you he didn't say that, but he meant it in spirit. We we know. We, he implied it. I, I, I was there when he meant it. <laughs> but, um, right. Uh, and uh, and the answer is is like uh, it's you know not necessarily you know it's you can get a variety of different experiences with it, but it comes with its own back. Like you know, yeah. Because we wrote a D twenty game. It's called Bleeding Edge. It has no D twenties in it. And I've had people tell me this is interesting. interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It confuses them instantly, huh? Yeah. You use, <laughs> Variant rules from an Earth Arcana, which was rolled D6s instead of D20s, but it's technically a D20. Uh, so, hmm. um, uh, yeah, it's got some assumptions in it that a lot of people would say, well, it's not a D20 game. So, we, no, it is. We said it, first of all, we said it was, so screw you. And secondly, it's got strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, charisma. You know, it, it's got, you know, rounds, combat rounds, yeah. and, and, you know, skills and a lot of the words you would see in a D20 game. Uh, so, you know, it, you know, but it's, I, I can see where people are coming from because we made several fundamental assumptions in the game that are, dead. but, um, mm -hmm. you know, like is, you know, D and D five, D and D three and D and D four are all D 20 games, but you wouldn't say they're all the same thing. Right. Right. It's a very fair point. I think I mean, though, with the universal mm -hmm. system. Oh, go ahead first. You first. No, I was going to say that I think that if you're going to draw the distinction, all of these games are different. Um, I, so it's like you can't expect that every D20 game is going to be the exact same because then why would you be paying for them for the art? I don't know. So, But you're yeah. right. Where do you draw those lines? But sorry, Griff. What were you going to say? Uh, it, it's all good. So I was going to say I do think that there is at least a functional place for these supposedly generic systems. And that is, of course, mm -hmm. when you want something specific that obviously doesn't exist, but you're not the full game designer, mm -hmm. but you have enough mm -hmm. initiative or push or drive to want to do it. Uh, my example here would be I have a little darling game that I'm trying to do right now. I want to have superpowers. I want to have mechs be useful and a thing people can hop in and out of. And I want political espionage. There's no system that does any one of those things well enough for me, let alone all <laughs> three of them within the same one. There is hey. no book on Earth, I think, that would actually sell that, I think. Well, I, I think you've got your work the... cut out for you. <laughs> you, you so make... it is something that has to be done myself in some fashion, and I need a base. Mm -hmm. Well, right. I mean, in other words, you can use the Riffs. baseline, and you have to know what a baseline is good at and what it's bad at. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, someone mentioned Rifts. So I would have to say, like, uh, uh, Rifts is the game. I've never had a rules argument while playing Rifts. Um <laughs> As in, no one respects the rules enough to argue about. Them. Got it. <laughs> um, there you go. But, um, uh, like what? What? Whenever you pick a, a core thing, like for example, powered by the apocalypse and and blades and dark, are very simple games. So they can be adapted to a variety of things, but uh, they have, you, you know, like, like you have to decide simplicity. Like we're making Abyss, which is going to be like people have told us our powered by the apocalypse games are too complicated to be powered by the apocalypse. Hmm. It's like uh, how? Well, well there's a, there's a depth know, thing but... though. No, I think that there's like those. You're saying that these systems are easier to port because they're not as specific. But I do think that what you give up there is is in depth, right? No, and I can right, totally right. I see mean, that. Yeah. At its core, power, like people would argue that at its core, Power by the Apocalypse is supposed to be simple. Like nothing. Yeah. 2D6 plus ads 
you could literally turn it into cyberpunk because cyberpunk is 1d10 plus ads if all yeah. you did was just you know you could literally build all of project red cyberpunk off of that base mm -hmm. because it's, it's the same core and of course d20 plus ads is the core behind d20 you'd have to change some of the action systems that kind of stuff but getting once again like once you decide in your core like you, you know how crunchy do you want your game to be if you're using yeah. d20 plus ads you have a much bigger swing range and then you get into a game like iron claw which has um a dice pool system now iron claw was designed that um it, because you take the highest out of all of your dice you can never get locked out and mm -hmm. uh, you always have a chance of doing something and buying more as diminishing returns but is that what you want if you were playing D D? When you get to 10th or 11th level, you want to be able to squash first or second level things without thinking about it. That's not a that's not a flaw of D20. That's a design decision. In mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, um, you know, um, uh, your core system dictates that. Iron Claw has no shutouts. D and D does. Um, you know, Powered by the Apocalypse has no turn order, and the GM doesn't do any secret rolling. If you you if the true power by the apocalypse would say this is a game where players do all of the rolling and GM does only fiat, you'd mm -hmm. have to design new things around that. Blades in the Dark responds to that by giving GM fiat and using a dice pool system. It's similar to Power by the Apocalypse and enjoys some DNA, but it's different. How crunchy do you want your game to be? If you were doing a space exploration game, um, you know, like like you said, World of Darkness might have problems because it's only a science skill, but there's a ring world game built out of the BRP, they all the call of Cthulhu DN. It's one of my favorite games and it's like got the one of the most ridiculous science systems you could imagine. Hmm. Probably more complicated than you would want if you were playing a regular game, but this is ring world, a game where you're all scientists exploring, you know, a place in the future where combat is rare and deadly, but it matters which one of you is the quantum physicist and that sort of thing. So it should have a system that that's, that's that complicated because we would be asking which one of us is the theoretical physicist, which one of us is the materials expert, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that sounds um, super fun. I'd love that. Uh, I guess maybe we should dig that one out. I mean, it's yeah, super, go ahead. It, it, it's like, so, and, and but basically, what we're getting at here is like I've run into a, a problem. I mean, I guess my summary would be like I, I've run into a problem where certain games I don't think were necessarily appropriate. Like Genesis, I have an issue with because while I think it was appropriate for Star Wars and and only a little bit appropriate, I've seen the efforts to try and make it work for other stuff. And it, it's got a very wishy-washy subjective system that if you don't have the Star Wars charts on the side to tell you what to do and what you can't do, mm -hmm. you wind up with roles that you spend 10 or 15 minutes interpreting. Because, like, when mm. you have five successes, but six failures, but triumph, uh, you know, I guess that means you succeed. But you did it mm -hmm. with disadvantage, so something also kind of goes wrong. So I got to sit here and think of something, and then, like, yeah. you know, with, without the handy charts that you already had in Star Wars on the, on the side, which would tell you when you did force or blaster stuff, something weird happened, mm -hmm. you might run into trouble. Tristat was the insane one, because Tristat uh, is like Rollmaster, where every skill has a variable cost and the variable cost is dependent on your class. So I want you to imagine a game where you have 60 skills and all of them have different uh, and 20 classes and each skill is a different point cost based on what your class is. Thanks. Uh, I mean, you could uh, say, what a nightmare. Yeah, you could say it's universal, but any tri-stat game I have to make, I'd have to invent 20 or 30 classes from whole cloth. You yeah. know, I I'd be doing all that work. Whereas, um, you know, like you said, you did Ghostbusters with World of Darkness. You tweaked it a little bit. Not completely inappropriate. And once again, I always like to say the problem you're not having is not a problem. I mean, if no one's bothered that there's a single craft skill, then no one's bothered by it. Right. Um, yeah. it, it's, uh, it's that issue. Um, I want to take that lasting issue is when people say the game's just about trying anything. Because the famous d d is not a combat game quote includes, oh no, your players can try anything. Well, yeah, we can try anything, but can we succeed? And sure. um, right, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like you know, like you could try to ride a horse in cyberpunk. Hey, maybe we're trying to steal a thoroughbred, maybe there's a cyber horse here, who maybe a dinosaur here, who knows? But once you put a rule in there that makes it impossible to pull off, you know, you know, then you can, you know, that gets into a weird situation. So that's what we're, I think we're all in agree. That's what we mean by nothing is universal. 
your game system will make fundamental assumptions about what characters can and cannot do and that mm. will be different than the than the genre it, it might not match the genre and then we might even argue what the genre is we basically the, the gist of it is uh, systems can be applicable and have broad applications but they will make poor assumptions about capability expression of your characters yeah all of these interpretations and simulations of the real world or of fantasy worlds are made through the lens of genre, whether they're mm-hmm. conscious or not. And that's part of one of the core features that differentiates these these games as written. Yeah. I do feel like we should probably like pull back again to something we said uh, in our last podcast, which is communication is always really important, especially with your players, to make sure everyone is on the same page about what genre they're playing. What is this game? Does it actually really fit? And what are they willing to go through in order to fit their expectations? And, and that's where I get angry as an indie game designer, because I'll uh, because I, you know, people will sometimes say role playing is over here and the rules are over there. And I'll say. That's not true. The rules have made fundamental assumptions. If I'm playing a fighter, yeah. I have a lot of hit points. I'm supposed to be able to take a lot of hits. If you tell me I can't take a lot of hits, I'll be confused because it says I can. And mm-hmm. and, and, you, and this is something the game made up. I you know I wanted you know fighter was a choice that the game put in my head. So um, you know or likewise with vampires, it's like I. I can't show up at the vampire game and play a Twilight vampire. The vampire game has these kinds of vampires in it. It's made these kinds of assumptions already for me. Uh, So that's not bad. That's the game channeling me into what's appropriate. So all of us at the table are talking about the same thing. You don't want the game to be universal. You want the game to narrow our experience down to where we're, you know, we know we're doing D and D not game of Thrones, not Lotor you know, not Harry Potter. We're doing D&D today. Exactly. I mean, Have they done it, a Harry Potter RPG yet? Oh, Just out of curiosity. You know, I'm, I'm sure it's there. It's one of the things that confused me, no one made one. During the oh, entire yeah. height of Harry Potter mania, no one made a Harry Potter game. And believe me, I was thinking about it. Oh. Yeah. Well, mm, guess the it's time passed, that, huh? Well, I mean, you see it emerging now. I think D&D... Well, I'm sure there's others as well, but I feel like the one that comes to the to the front forefront of my mind is Strixhaven, which is actually a Magic the Gathering setting that's I think getting a D and D source book, and that is very much Wizarding World of Magic the Gathering. Yeah, no, it, it, might, it might happen now. It's it, it's weird to me that it took 20 years for right? Magic it's to weird integrated with D and D. I would have thought Timing's they were much sooner. They waited this long. Who can say? So I think that's probably a good note to go ahead and ask for uh, concluding remarks now about this. So, Red, what do you have to say about universal systems that we can end off on? I'm still probably going to buy Genesis system even when I have disposable cash. It's on my list. I don't know why. I think well, in general... Is... <laughs> I know. It's, it's... I don't know. This is the end of our recording for today, and I'm, I'm blitzed. But I think that... Uh... For me, I I think that a lot of the attractive nature of a lot of games is what their mechanics can bring to the table in terms of the type of stories that they can tell, which is why I feel like, although on some weird way I respect the urge to make a universal system, I don't think it's ever going to take off in the way that, you know, a D&D or, you know, any any kind of genre-specific game will. That's my two cents. What yeah. do you have to end off on? Related to that, people have asked when we would release a like a version of the Cardinal Engine as the in-house name for where you have Iron Claw and Urban Jungle, and mm-hmm. we released it. And in many ways, you've seen them fall back on it because you know 2003 was um, World of Darkness as a generic book, and you were supposed to buy Vampire and Werewolf and Mage to add to it. Here we are in 2021, and Chronicles of Darkness, you buy a one-stop vampire book with the rules in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically a lot of places have changed their minds on that kind of uh, universality, that the idea that the rule book could be adapted. Uh, instead, you know, they present it to you as one stop. And yeah, we never did it because, like I said, at, at some level, there would be a fundamental assumption of what we did in the rules that would be different. And you can even see it in different mutations. Pathfinder is not the same as Dungeons & Dragons. They're both labeled D20, but, you know, the, the there's even differences in these forks 
that will give you know that people if you know if people can defend Pathfinder as being better than D and D, then there have to be differences. There's something yeah. that's not you know there's something that even though it's a universal system, there's something about them that tweaked for different experiences. And there were a lot of D20 games out there that fizzled. as D20 Traveler, this D20 Vampire. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, playing those games will give you a difference. It, it's just a, it's a good base to build on, but you have to know that at your core, there are certain assumptions that the game will make that are not identical. And that's why there's still room for uh, several different takes on it. There's different cores you can use, but nothing is universal. It, 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 it has to it makes some assumptions that are different than others, and then the designer will tweak it even more. All right. So there we go. So I think that's going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. That's all for Notes for the Aleph. We stream bi-weekly Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern, and you can come join us live at Twitch at twitch.tv slash Ractus. We also stream weekly recording uh, tabletops at the same channel. You can come join us at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sundays and Wednesdays. Norman Rafferty here is a partner and writer for Sangui Games. Check out sanguigames.com and join us on the Reddit and Twitter. Look forward to the upcoming Book of Corals, Iron Claw expansion, where you can engage your own pirate adventure. Don't forget to check out Red Rabbit and Booking for a Game over at startplayinggames.com as Red Rabbit. And be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and come see us all again. Until next time, everybody.